بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا وما بعد نبرد سيستر إمجين the times of رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم in Mecca where he preached Islam it was a time of uh, huge change right massive change if you look at it uh, it was somebody who was preaching a doctrine which ran contrary to what the Arabs had believed in and what they used to do as far as their belief and worship is concerned um, for centuries, right? For as, as long as they could remember. And uh, what's more, and this was really, if you look at it, uh, that was the, in my view, that was the real reason for the... Uh, for the opposition to him was not really so much because of the theological uh, angle, the theological difference of worshipping, worshipping only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because people who worship many gods, um, they can add and subtract uh, quite easily. I mean, they mentally, they are, they are okay with that. The, it is the monotheistic people, the people who worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, who have problems uh, with uh, adding on anyone else to his worship and this is alhamdulillah this is how it should be but uh, people who worship many gods uh, you know who, for them to add on something is not a difficult thing so it was not uh, it was really not so much that I mean, I'm, it's, I'm not saying it is not a, at all but definitely that was not the main reason the main reason was that Rasulullah represented for them a complete upheaval in their social order. They had a system which was run by these by these billionaires, right? The oligarchs. In today's world, if they are Russian, we call them oligarchs. If they are American, we call them billionaires. Um, so they had a system, a government which runs, which which ran, and the people who ran it were these oligarchs, these businessmen, these billionaires, uh, who men who met whenever they, they, they felt the need to meet uh, in a place called Anadwa, which was the their gathering house. And uh, they decided whatever they decided. Now they were supreme, their word was law, they were above the law themselves, they could quite literally do whatever they wanted. For example, Abu Jahl uh, murdered in broad daylight before probably hundreds of witnesses. Uh, Sumaya bint Khayyat and her husband uh, Yasir and uh, there was nothing to pay I mean they, <coughs> nobody criticized him nobody said anything uh, you had Umayyah bin Khalaf who used to torture Bilal bin Rabah uh, you know every day he used to beat him and torture him for no reason and nobody said anything the, the poor and the and, and uh, slaves and so on had absolutely zero rights they had they could the, the, the wealthy people could do whatever they wanted with them and uh, they had every luxury that money could buy they, everything was legal for them you know as far as they were concerned there was no one who could um, tell them something is illegal or they should not do it so it, this was the kind of um, yeah, situation they were in and they loved it they, they, they were very happy with it now comes this person and to from their point of view to make it to make matters worse he's one of them and on top of being one of them, he's also one of the privileged class. So ideally, according to them, he should have been enjoying these things himself, right? He should have had slaves, he should have beat up people, he should have done what, got drunk or whatever. He should have uh, been enjoying these things. And obviously, uh, you know, you, uh, you enjoy something, you support it. So this is what he should have been doing. Instead of that, uh, he is criticizing these things, he's talking about uh, social justice is talking about anti-racism is talking about women's rights is talking about uh, you know he's speaking against alcohol uh, he's speaking against uh, oppression of uh, the weak and so on uh, so obviously this was not acceptable to them this was this was something which was you know very bad and so they said he's you know maybe maybe he's gone mad maybe jinn affected him or uh, something is wrong with his mind uh, which is why he's saying like this because to them it's a, it appeared to be something which was completely illogical. It's how can somebody in that position 
it can you know their, their point of view was if he was somebody who would who was not entitled to this in their system and he was uh, you know criticizing it then one could say well you know he wants it so he is uh, uh, you know he's fighting because he's not getting it but in this case it was somebody it was his for the taking i mean he was he was from the premier family uh, there was no one to stop him if he wanted to behave like abu jahl or abu lahab or anybody uh, but he did not behave like that. He, he on the uh, on the on the contrary, uh, he took up the cudgels and he took up the issues of uh, of the weak and the, and and of course that meant uh, the women and the slaves and so on and so forth. Uh, he talked about charity. He talked about uh, you know this mindless pursuit of profit. He said this is a this is a bad thing. And he's talking about the the hereafter, which according to these people were you know this is a illogical thing. I mean, how is what's here? What's here after? I mean, we don't see it. So how can it be real? Now, this is the, this was their problem. And so there was huge upheaval. Now, again, Mecca was uh, literally the center of the world for them because uh, of the Kaaba and people used to come from all over Arabia uh, for pilgrimage and for trade. And Mecca was, a, was a, became a trade center between uh, Sham in the north and Yemen in the south. These caravans, which went uh, north and south, they would stop in Mecca, uh, and uh, so Mecca became a trade center. So it was a, it was a very happening place, and there were lots of people from all over who came to Mecca, and uh, these ideas they were spreading all over the place. So the 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 Quraysh especially were very perturbed and they were very disturbed that this was happening. Now, in this context, a man called uh, Bimad al-Azji from uh, Azjauna in, South, in Southern Arabia, he came uh, to Mecca and he heard people who were saying that we have a man among us who is affected by jinn. So this man, Bimad al-Azji, was, uh, uh, was a nice man. He was a you know, very kind-hearted man. And he uh, knew something about uh, exorcism and so on. So he went to Rasulullah he asked them who is this person, they showed him, so he said he went to him. And his intention was good, I mean he didn't go with a bad intention. So he had never met Rasulullah he didn't know anything about him. So he, want, he, he went to him and he said, look, uh, I know how to exorcise uh, a jinn. So, uh, you know, if, if somebody is possessed, I know what to do. Uh, so would you like me to, to, uh, to cure you, right? Would you, would you like me to... Uh, take out, take out your jinn. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam simply said to him, the khutba masnuna, which is uh, the 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 the, uh, the khutba that we usually do in Juma. He said, "Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruhu wa nu'minu bihi wa natawakkalu alayhi wa na'uzu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati amalina." من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله. So he just said this to him, and uh, the man was struck. He said, "Oh Muhammad," he said, "Stop." He said, "Can you repeat this? Can you repeat the words to me?" So Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم repeated the words to him, and then the man said, "By Allah." These words will reach the depth of the ocean. So Rasulullah said to him, if you really believe that, then accept Islam. And the man extended his hand, he said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu annaka Rasulullah. He accepted Islam, just like that. Right? And then Rasulullah said to him, take a pledge for your people. Right? Accept Islam on behalf of your people. So when you go back, they will all become Muslim. And Bimad said, I pledge for my people. That's an amazing story if you think about this of a man who got Hidayah in one single meeting for a few minutes. That's it. And it shows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides all those who are sincere. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his messenger وسلم, to guide us. So guidance is never denied. If somebody is not guided, then they must ask themselves, what is it that I am doing to shut out guidance? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his Nabi so that people are guided and so that people will be saved from Jahannam and they will go to Jannah. If that was not the uh, purpose, then there, there, is, there was no need to send the Nabi. But Allah sent the Nabi because He wants this to happen. 
Many years later, Rasulullah one of the uh, armies of uh, the Muslims, uh, they were traveling and they passed by uh, the village of uh, Bimad. Uh, and as they passed by, the commander, he, he stopped and he asked uh, his soldiers, he said, did anyone take anything from these people? And one soldier says, yes, I took one camel from them. The commander said, give it back. Because these are the people of Bimad and Rasulullah gave them protection. Hamar ibn al-Abusa, uh, he said in the time of Jahiliyyah, I had belief in my heart that the religion of my people is false and that worshipping idols is wrong. Now you see this kind of, this, this kind of people, you see them to this day. There are people who are not Muslim, who are following, who, you know, you can't even say they are following because they are not following, but they are, they are from some other religion which worships idols and they know it is wrong. So they don't follow their religion. They don't. They don't worship. They don't go to their, uh, you know, te- places of worship, temples and churches and whatnot. Uh, but they have also not entered Islam. So, but so they are there in in this uh, space between, <coughs> between uh, right and wrong. So Amr bin Absa radhiyallahu he said one day, uh, I heard that there was a man preaching a new religion. So I went to meet him secretly and I I asked him what are you? He said I am a prophet. He said what does that mean? Uh, so Amr said, what does that mean? Um, <coughs> so he said, the um, the man said, uh, <coughs> he said, the man said, I was sent by Allah. Uh, so Amr said, uh, what did he send you with? He said, what did he send you with? And... Uh, he said, the man said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, he sent me with a message of worshipping him alone, associating no gods with him and not to uh, worship idols, to destroy the idols. Uh, so Amr said, can I follow you? And he said, the man said, he said, you cannot follow me now, but when you hear that I have prevailed, then you can come and join me. Uh, Amr said that I used to constantly ask about him and his condition. I used to always ask people, uh, where is this person and, and how is the situation now? One day that I, uh, one day I heard that he had migrated to Medina and was victorious. So I went to meet him. Uh, I asked him, I said, do you remember me? And Rasulullah said, yes, you came to meet me in Makkah. He said, Ya Rasulullah, teach me about that which you know from Allah and teach me about Salah and Wudu. And Rasulullah taught him. There are so many beautiful uh, stories like this, which are, you know, may Allah make us among those who uh, respond to the truth the way the Sahaba responded to the truth. SubhanAllah. Another one of these famous uh, uh, stories is uh, that of uh, Abu Dhar al Ghifari. Uh, anhu. Abu Dhar al Ghifari says that. Um, my brother and I uh, and my mother left the land of Ghifar. Now see, these are people who have not come to Islam yet. I mean, they are uh, still uh, on whatever religion they had. But the heart tells them that what they are worshipping, what they are doing is not correct. So Abu Dhar said that my, uh, my brother and I and my mother left the land of Ghifar because our people were disrespectful, uh, disrespectful of the Ashurum, Ashurul Hurum, the sacred months. The Ghifar were, uh, were bandits, they were highway robbers and they raided caravans. And uh, in, now raiding alone in, uh, uh, in Arabia, 7th century Arabia, was not... Uh, was not a, a, considered to be a bad thing. You know, people, tribes raided one another and uh, it was considered legal and whatever booty they got from the raids was considered legal. So people did that all the time. Now the, these people, the Ghifar, uh, raided uh, caravans. But uh, Abu Dhar Ghifari's point of view was that uh, <clears throat> they should have, uh, they, should, they should have stopped that during the uh, holy months. Now, uh, he said they didn't do that. So these people, they left the Ghifar. Uh, he said we stayed, 
with an uncle who was very generous to us. Um, then he said, while we were staying with him, some people who were jealous uh, of us told the uncle that uh, Abu Dhar Radhiallahu whose brother Unnais was uh, interested in his wife, in the wife of the uncle. So the uncle mentioned this to Abu Dhar and his mother. Now, Abu Dhar was infuriated, he got very angry. And he said, this accusation has cancelled all your hospitality and they left. Then they settled near Makkah. Now one day Unnais went to Makkah to do some business and he met Rasulullah He returned and told Abu Dhar Radiallahu about it. He said there is a man preaching a new religion. And uh, he told Abu Dhar Radiallahu what Rasulullah had said to him about the new religion. Now Abu Dhar Ghafari said that I have already been worshipping Allah for three years. He said I used to pray in whichever direction Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would point me to and in whatever way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would guide, would guide me to. And I would pray all night and then I would fall asleep and wake only when the sun woke me up. Now you see these people how sincere they were in, uh, in wanting to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in wanting to... Uh, in, one, in, in, in their own spiritual welfare, they were so interested. I mean, imagine just worshipping, uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all night. And this is not something he did on just one night. This was his custom. And he would say, I would wake up when the sun would wake me up. <coughs> <coughs> now, Unnes told Abu Dhar that the people were accusing Rasulullah of being a sorcerer and so on. Uh, Abu Dhar Radhiallahu said, um, you have not satisfied my curiosity. I must go and see uh, for myself. So he went to Makkah and uh, the first man he saw, he said, can you guide me to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Unfortunately, that man was not uh, a Muslim. And so he st started shouting, he called people, he said, look, see, this man is uh, you know, wanting to meet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they started throwing stones at Abu Dhar Ghifari Radhiallahu and they started beating him and he says, until I fell unconscious. He said, when I, when I woke, then they left him there. He said, when I woke up, uh, I went to Zamzam, I drank some water and washed myself and he said, then I went to the Kaaba and I stayed there for 30 days. He just stayed by the Kaaba for one month. He said, I ate nothing, I only drank Zamzam he said, not only did I feel, did I not feel hungry, not only did I not feel hungry, but I actually started gaining weight. He said, then I saw two women making tawaf and on each turn they used to touch two idols, one called Isaf and the other one called Naida, uh, two of the idols in the Kaaba. Uh, so Abu Dhar, uh, you know, Abu Dhar was a man like that. He was, for one thing, he was a man who was who had no fear. Uh, secondly, he was very direct and he was uh, he was not very polite. So he said what you know he wanted to say. So he made some um, he made a, a sort of a, you know nasty comment about that. Um, and the women they heard when he said first you know what he had to say. Uh, he, the women didn't hear him. The second time he said, he said, I said something even worse, more nasty. And the women heard him and they started uh, screaming uh, and they ran away. Uh, now, as they ran away, they met Rasulullah and Abu Bakr uh, Rasulullah asked them, what was the matter? Why are they running and screaming? And they said that there is a heretic over there and he said something very bad. Rasulullah came to Abu Dhar, Abu Dhar Rifari Radhiallahu and he asked him, he said, where are you from? Uh, Abu Dhar Radhiallahu said, I am from Rifar. Now, Rasulullah Sallallahu um, he put his hand on his forehead like this. When Abu Dhar uh, Rifari said, I am from Rifar, Nabi Sallallahu put his hand on his forehead. So Abu Dhar Radhiallahu said, I thought he did not like what I said. So I, he said, I put, out, put my hand uh, forward to take his hand away from his forehead 
uh, but Abu Bakr slapped my hand down and said, put your hand down. Uh, because Rasulullah put his hand on his forehead like that, uh, you know, uh, like we say face palm, um, in astonishment because here was a man from the bandits of Rifa in search of the truth. Whereas the Quraysh of Makkah, who were supposed to be the guardians of the Kaaba and whatnot, and they were the religious leaders of the Arabs, they were worshipping idols. So Rasulullah is saying, SubhanAllah, see, the, uh, see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides who he, uh, whoever has sincerity and who he wants to guide. Uh, so then Abu Dhar Ghifari said, then Radha Lanhu, he said, I accepted Islam. Now Rasulullah told him to keep his Iman secret. He said, do not announce it. But Abu Dhar, this was not his nature. So Abu Dhar Radha Lanhu went out the next day and he announced his Iman in public. Again, the same thing happened. People gathered, they started beating him until he was unconscious. But mercifully for him, they would have killed him. But mercifully for him, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Al Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib who came. He rushed to his rescue and he said to the people, Do you know? <coughs> he said, Do you know who this man is? Do you know where he's from? He said, He's from the Rifa. Now, as soon as the people heard this, they ran away because they feared the Rifa. And uh, if, you know, if, if Abu Dhar had been killed, Radilanu, they were afraid that uh, Rifar would not allow a single uh, caravan from Makkah uh, to pass by them. Now, this, this thing happened. Again, next day the same thing happened. The third day the same thing happened. Three times. <coughs> then Rasulullah said to Abu Dhar Rifari, he said, go back to your people. And uh, when you hear that I have prevailed, then you come and meet me. So then you come and meet me. Uh, so Abu Dhar al said, I went back to our people and he started preaching Islam. By the time Rasulullah came to Medina, half his tribe, al Ghifar, were Muslim. And the others, they said, when we go to meet Rasulullah, we will also accept Islam. So one day, the Sahaba saw a big cloud of dust approaching Medina and they rushed for their weapons, thinking that it may be an army coming to attack Medina. But Rasulullah said, don't worry, that is Abu Dhar. And that was true. So the whole tribe of Befar came and they <coughs> accepted Islam. There was another tribe at the time who were the rivals of the Befar, also also a tribe of bandits and highway robbers. They were called Aslam. Uh, when they heard that Befar had accepted Islam, they came to Rasulullah and they said, if Befar have accepted Islam, we also want to accept Islam. And Rasulullah said, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive Befar and give peace to Aslam. Ghaffara, he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ghaffara Allah ghaffar and Sallam Allah aslam. Now think about this, the big lesson that we have here is that when you make effort, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only grants success, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants success with barakah. So the result of the effort is not in proportion to the effort, but it is much more than the effort. The work of one man which resulted in two <coughs> major tribes accepting Islam. Abu Dhar Ghifari had spent only a few days in the company of Rasulullah before he was sent back to his tribe. Yet his preaching was so powerful that his whole tribe accepted Islam. And then thanks to that, another tribe of Al-Aslam, they also accepted Islam. So whoever searches for guidance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give it to him as long as the person is sincere. This is a very important thing to keep in mind. Sometimes people say, oh, but you know, what can so-and-so do? They did not have guidance. No, if they didn't have guidance, it, mean, it, it means that they didn't want guidance. They got guidance and they rejected guidance because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not. If Allah didn't want to guide people, he would not have sent the Nabi alayhi salam. He wouldn't have sent his books. He wouldn't have sent any of the Nabi alayhi salam. Because people were, people were living their lives in whichever way they considered to be right, you know, and, and, and things were going on. So Allah did not need to, uh, to send guidance and to send his abiyya and to send his books and so on and so forth if it was not his intention to guide people. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants the best for his people. And therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent, uh, sent his abiyya alayhi wasalam. He sent his books. The last of them is Al-Quran Al-Kareem and the last of the abiyya alayhi wasalam. Uh, and the Rasul is Muhammad, Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa after whom there is no Rasul and after whom there is no Nabi. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always <coughs> uh, 
uh, guides. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, even if you hear one ayah from me, teach it to others. Balighu, balighu anni, walau ayah aw kama kala alayhi salatu wasallam. So teaching and learning is an ongoing process. We as the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu have been given this responsibility of carrying forward the work of our Nabi alayhi salam. Abu Dhar radiallahu was not afraid of people and he was confident enough about his deen and willing to pay the price of communicating it to others. It's a strange and tragic paradox that the only beneficial thing that you get punished for instead of being rewarded and thanked for is Islam. Um, Abu Dhar radiallahu went to verify the truth himself. So it's very important for us to and show that we have the right knowledge. You cannot benefit from wrong information. So uh, many times there are people who pretend to have knowledge and so on. It's very important to ensure that you get the right inf- right knowledge. So Abu Dhar went himself to verify the truth. He didn't just follow whatever people were saying. Uh, he went to meet Rasulullah and to check for himself. When he was satisfied, he then com- he followed it completely and not partially. So this is the, the second trap and the second problem that we have is that we follow of Islam what we like to follow. We don't uh, follow it completely. But Abu Dhar al-Fari didn't do that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya ayyuhal ladhina aman udkhulu fi silmi kafatan Oh, you who believe, enter into Islam completely. And that is what Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu and the Sahaba did. They entered fully and completely and not partially. And they did not do that gradually over time. They just, whatever Allah ordered, they started following it from that moment onwards without any argument. This was the secret of success and this is the reason why they were so hugely, hugely productive and powerful and influential. <clears throat> Rasulullah said, don't just follow people, use your intelligence. He said, don't belittle anything good, no matter how insignificant. You throw the seed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it grow. There are many such stories about the Sahaba which show us a generation that was unique. People who, was, who had been um, uh, steeped in idolatry and all kinds of evil, all kinds of social evils and all kinds of inequities um, who literally turned into the most pious and beautiful people the world has ever seen overnight, just like that, right? It was the strength of their belief and the honesty with which they acted on it, which was the cause, right? There there was no, with the Sahaba, there was no hypocrisy. There was no, um, you know, dilly-dallying and there was no, uh, should I, shouldn't I, and uh, they they, they did not allow (coughs) their nafs, they didn't allow their desires to come in the way of guidance. This was the, this was a huge, 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 um, you know, benefit, uh, or rather the, the, this is the big secret of uh, the success of the Sahaba Ridwanullahi Alayhi Majma'in, which uh, I remind myself and you about which is something that we need to think about and say that uh, what is it that made them so successful, this generation, where uh, literally they sort of, you know, they, they flipped and they went from uh, being people who were uh, most definitely not worthy of uh, emulation uh, and people who were, you know, uh, onto all kinds of uh, All, all kinds of uh, evil stuff, uh, they became the best of people. So, and this is something that we need to ask ourselves also because that is our, uh, this is our problem today. Our problem today is the uh, minimalist thinking that we have with respect to Islam. We try to do the bare minimum. I'm not talking about those who don't do anything at all. That is, we all, may Allah have mercy on us. We also have those people who uh, do nothing at all. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about those people who, Alhamdulillah, they, uh, you know, they, they are good people. They want to do something uh, good with themselves and with their lives. Um, but those people also, uh, they try to take it piecemeal, right? They 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 don't want to take the whole uh, religion uh, completely as Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala uh, gave it to us. 
And that's why like anything which is done piecemeal, it doesn't benefit us. And this is something to think about because, you know, we, we claim to be Muslims. And yet the benefits that Islam is supposed to give us uh, don't seem to be in our lives. So you might ask yourself, what is the point of being Muslim? Because even after I'm Muslim, I'm still not getting the barakah that Allah, Allah promised me. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Nabi sallam, said, when a Muslim and a true believer raises his hands and asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, makes dua, Allah will accept his dua before his hands come down. Now, does, is, it, does, is it happening to us? Now think about that. Ne? Is, it, uh, is this happening to us? It's not happening to us. We, uh, we are uh, people who... Uh, and the reason why it doesn't happen to us is because we seem to be uh, we, we seem to take things uh, partly so the it never gets to the point where the balance tips the our balance never tips because we we don't put in enough effort into enough load into the pan for it to tip the balance and that is the the, the big takeaway from the story of uh, bimad al azji and uh, abu al ghafari and uh, anu that let us follow completely. Alhamdulillah, we said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Let us follow that completely, not in bits and pieces. Uh, if we take something, we leave something. This is not something for us to do. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to what pleases Him and to save us from what doesn't please Him.